Hey everybody, welcome to Comics Rant, another episode brought to you by me, uh, your host Arvin Bautista. And here at Comics Rant, we don't really believe in personal hygiene or haircuts or any of that stuff. So you can see me as natural as possible. <laughs> anyway, um, continuing my series on Snyder Cut uh, Love uh, with more of my Snyder Cut fan art as well as some comic books that I feel connect to the story uh, pretty directly and as source material that the movie's probably pulled from. And if you guys want to read more uh, because your interest was piqued from the Snyder Cut and the uh, Snyder Verse, um, then these are some of the books that you guys should take a look at. Um, anyway, let's get on with the show. For this episode, I'm going to do something a little different than the previous Snyder Cut um, comparison episodes where I take a book that seems very similar in story and sometimes even in structure and they uh, use, a direct, uh, use it directly as a source for the Snyder Cut story. For this episode, I want to talk about the characterization of one of the characters in the Snyder Cut. Um, in this case, it's Cyborg. And I feel like they really got the character that I remember reading when I was a kid, and it was from the Marv Wolfman and George Perez run. And if you guys have seen any of the Teen Titans uh, animated show or Teen Titans Go, those are great. Um, I really love those shows, Teen Titans Go. Um, cracks me up all the time. It's just phenomenal. Art direction's amazing and the humor is <laughs> crazy. Um, but that version of Cyborg is pretty different in character. Um, he's a little bit more fun-loving and uh, jokes around a lot. Uh, he's still smart, um, but you know, he's not this Cyborg. So this, and that's fine, um, because that, that was fine, um, I enjoy those shows. I have no problem with those shows. Even the cyborg in the new Doom Patrol is a pretty different character um, from this guy right here. And I feel like in the Snyder Cut, in the Zack Snyder universe, they really got him to the cyborg I remembered. And I was very su surprised because I'm so used to cyborg in Teen Titans Go and Teen Titans. And, um, you know, talking about waffles and eating pizza, hanging out with Beast Boy, those things still apply. He still um, is closest to Beast Boy in this run, but I always remembered Vic Stone as being very angry. He was a very angry guy. He was kind of, I mean, his humor was a lot more biting than Changeling, Beast Boy's um, humor. He, um, it seemed like a little, a little, it had a little bit more meaner of an edge. And that was his character. And that was what I remembered. And I always thought that was fascinating because I thought like, hey, man, he's like Cyborg. He's got cool robot parts. You know, as a kid, I thought that was the coolest thing. But, you know, in this book, especially like in the first few issues of Titans, he was still coming to grips with all that stuff. You know, he, he did not see this as something great. And, you know, he was an athlete. Um, in the book, I marked out some of these pages here that I thought might be nice for us to look at. I loved how he he was always wearing this hoodie. You know, he's a jock, so he's wearing these like kind of athletic uh, jogging pants and trainers. You know, and and a hoodie. I always knew he had like a hoodie on. He was always wearing these baggy sweatshirts. And as a kid, that stood out because you know these characters i'm reading superhero comics i'm thinking like yeah he should always just look like that but you know to him this was just he was like a freak show and uh that was very uh prominent in the way that marv wolfman wrote him in the way that george perez drew him he was not happy uh with this you know and it, it makes sense there's a lot of drama with um how he was dealing with this this baggage and also a lot of his anger towards his dad. Um, you know, you don't really see that in the cartoons. That's a little serious. Um, it's more obvious in the movie. So I really appreciated that he had this conflict with his dad that survived his origin from, you know, from 
this book. This is like an 80s book. And like I, I was talking about in the other episodes, the Snyder Cut was pulling from more uh, modern um, DC comic stories, right? So it was really awesome that they reference the original run and the original appearance of Cyborg. And, you know, they were always... We get a little bit more insight into his dad's thoughts and how how it turns out, you know, in this uni- in this story, he, it was an experiment that uh, him and his wife were working on that caused this accident that kind of messed up Vic and killed his mom. They make it a little bit more clean in the Snyder Cut because they make it so it's a car accident. You know, there's no need to explain what this weird protoplasm creature is. It's a to- totally different story that was in uh, the beginning episodes uh, beginning issues of titans the new teen titans um you know you have scenes of him hanging out in the fire escape which is in the movie as well and he's got his hoodie on trying to cover most as much of himself as he can right like it's a very visual way of showing his emotional state and, and i love that 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 showed through in the movie and you know, he's just always in direct conflict with his dad and just cursing him, basically, for most of this arc. So the main arc here it, uh, takes place in in, um, in a, quite a few issues, actually. Not in, in your traditional five or four issue arc that is not nowadays. Um, but I kind of like, like, you know, I'll see some moments here where he actually opens up to Beast Boy. You know, for most of this... Uh, most of the arc, the story, he's always trying to act tough, and, and he's always angry. And but the, uh, this panel right here, he actually opens up to Beast Boy, which is great. And he says, um, you know, the rest of you, even Goldie Starfire, you're used to things on a cosmic level. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. And man, every so often, I get a little nervous, maybe even a little scared. So. In his character in Zack Snyder's Justice League, it is that. Um, you know, he's trying to help out, but he is not in the league of Superman, Wonder Woman, or Batman, right? And it's interesting because his origin, Zack Snyder makes a point. Zack Snyder and, and Chris Terrio make a point to kind of align his story with Man of Steel, right? His dad sacrifices himself in Justice League the same way that Pa Kent did. And it was like a, a willing sacrifice, uh, basically, right? And in Justice League, it, it was to help uh, the, the League track Steppenwolf and where all his stuff was going on. So it was, you know, not a wasted sacrifice. But he saw it just like Clark did. And he, he, he basically has a lot of things to share with Superman, which I thought was kind of cool. Um but yeah, so he's starting to show become very vulnerable, and by the end of this whole um, uh, kind of grand opening story, which is like involves Deathstroke, the Fearsome Five, and uh, Trigon. The first time they meet up with Trigon, the Justice League is in here too in this first arc. Um, he, Marv Wolfman, and George Perez wrap it up with uh, Vic's story. So uh, it's interesting because he just doesn't even want to talk to his dad. Just and he, and he won't give his dad a chance to talk. So it's the same here. It flows in this paneling the same way where he says, He doesn't look at me. When our eyes meet, he turns away. Why won't he listen? Why can't he believe? And then he tries to talk to Vic and he says, Then, then Victor, please, even if you won't believe me, listen to me. Let me talk. And Cyborg basically basically says, talk all I, all my life. All you've ever done is talk. Sorry, but I've got nothing left to talk about. So even here in the sequence, it mirrors it in Zack Snyder's uh, Justice League really well. You know, un- you know, until the end where he listens to a tape recorder uh, after his dad had died, after they had saved the world, right? So it, it's similar because this uh, whole crazy arc is wrapping up and it's finishing up with Cyborg's, um, basically the bow at the end of Cyborg's um, storyline here, right? And he gets to talk to his dad and it turns out, you know, his dad is actually dying from the same accident that killed his mom and 
um, messed him up. He's slowly dying, almost like it's a form of cancer of some sort or disease that will just basically take over his uh, life and and kill him at the end. And they, they make up, you know, he says he hates himself, but his dad forgives him completely, just much like in the movie. Um, and he actually gets to spend time with his dad. He, like, plays baseball with him, goes fishing, you know, hangs out with him, and it wraps it up really nicely, and he gets to say goodbye to his dad. Um, and in a way, it's a little bit more tragic, I think, in um, in um, Zack Snyder's Justice League. But it works out because uh, I think the dad just always knew, right? Uh, there's a moment that they also get to spend with each other very briefly because Vic saves him, chooses to save him from these parademons like midway in the movie. And um, it was a good wrap up uh, in the movie. And to kind of tee up Cyborg and get him started. Well, hopefully would have gotten him started back then. And also for this comic, uh, it gives a lot more spotlight to the character of Cyborg. Uh, which is great, you know, one of the newer characters there. And kind of um, brings his arc uh, all together um, when he becomes a hero. Um, I just wanted to mention too, like, when I started reading... See, so here he's still kind of hiding his face. Anyway, sorry, tangent. When I was reading uh, The Titans, or when I was introduced to this book, it was through my cousin who had access to all these imported um, U.S. books. So when it came out, he would have the latest issue, which was expensive, and I didn't have access to any of that. Um, so this is volume one. This is where it all starts, The Titans, Marv Wolfman, and George Perez. And Inker was Romeo Tanghal which is a Filipino artist and uh, they stick together for quite a, um, some time I think until the next half of the Titans where it becomes um, the the new Titans I think or Tales of the Teen Titans as well and George Perez I think and Marv Wolfman George Perez comes back I think he leaves for a little bit and then comes back and he has like an even better run and that was the run, the second half of the run in Titans with Perez is where I jumped in uh, so this stuff I never even got to read this stuff but a lot of the characterization kinda came through in that second run as well of Cyborg and I think Perez inks more of himself um, Tanghal, Tanghal does a really great job uh, inking him it's very solid you know it's it's very attractive but you know I love Perez inking Perez it's just um, great looking stuff I mean I guess any artist inking themselves would be great but the other guy that I like inking George Perez is Jerry Ordway and I will probably have a Jerry Ordway centric episode one of these days because he's one of my favorite artists and I love their collaboration, George Perez and Jerry Ordway, on Crisis on Infinite Earths. And that's really where I jumped into the DC bandwagon and became a lifer. I mean, you know, I read Superman before that and Batman. But Crisis was where it just really made me a hardcore DC fan. And uh, Ordway was inking a lot of uh, Perez's stuff and I would swipe a lot of... George Perez and Jerry Ordway uh, panels from that. If I can find them, I'll, I'll bring them into one of these episodes. Um, but it's very solid stuff. It's very good. I don't think anybody really, in the introductions, they didn't really expect Titans to go anywhere. And uh, it's a, just a, a testimony to their skills that they've made this uh, other franchise for DC of a bunch of sidekicks and this legacy um you know because later on robin grows up he becomes nightwing you know all this time he's just robin he's still wearing his robin suit and later on he becomes nightwing i think in the second uh half of the the run uh in any case give this a read the definitely like just on its own just for fun go read it the New Teen Titans by Marv Wolfman and George Perez is some amazing stuff. And of course, Romeo Tanjal. Um, great work, good stuff. And Cyborg is, that Cyborg is the one that will all I will always remember as the Cyborg. cyborg. And it's so great to see him show up 
in Zack Snyder's Justice League. In any case, that's it for the comic portion of Comics Rant. I will see you guys on the next half, and I'm going to start drawing some more Zack Snyder Justice League fan art. See you guys then. For today's drawing, it is the Lord of Apocalypse himself, Darkseid. Um, he looked great uh, in some of the trailers that uh, they were showing as uh, Zack Snyder's Justice League was about to be released. And I did not think, um, or at least I had some very high expectations uh, to fill to get um, dark side looking right uh, in live action and you know Avengers did Thanos already and people loved him he looked great right he looked like the comics but you know I'm a dark side fan so uh, it's this creation of Kirby's that has been um, raised to this uh, ultimate bad guy status level in the DC universe and so I wasn't sure how they'd be able to capture someone as um, imposing uh, to say the least uh, as dark side and let me tell you they got him perfect uh, you know he's not he's not his costume isn't exactly like how Jack Kirby drew it or any kind of stuff like that but he got his uh, presence so well he was super scary and uh, I love the horror movie kind of aesthetic approach to him and it just pushed this whole notion that Snyder has been playing with about gods and demons and all that kind of stuff I mean he was just scary he was scary looking and he was only in the movie for a few minutes I mean it was a good chunk I thought it would just be like his silhouette or something and glowing red eyes but there was a whole lot more to him. There was a voice. There was like, you know, dialogue between him and Steppenwolf and Dasad and armies. And, you know, the movie just delivered um, Darkseid on, on all uh, fronts for me, for this fanboy. Um, and my favorite scene with him was when Steppenwolf... It's this crazy tech that I enjoy in these movies, even in Man of Steel, where... It's not the digital uh, screen readout that we're used to seeing, like as uh, and pairing with technology, right? Like everything's on screen, touch technology, even in Minority Report, right? Like you, you're waving your hands in the air. You got like a VR goggle headset, whatever. This is like Earth's notion of technology, but uh, even in Man of Steel, the technology there is like this weird like magnetic rock uh, metal thing that can form 3d objects basically uh, instead of like a it's it's tactile right like you, you almost look like it looks like you could reach into it and it's sculptural the technology in man of steel and then in apocalypse they have a <laughs> i don't know what they have but like <laughs> the Steppenwolf basically plugged in this mother box into this metal um, sheet, right? Like this iron um, wall of like this leftover um, piece from like this nuclear reactor facility that he was in. And he plugs it in there and this, uh, it makes everything molten. <laughs> if you haven't seen the movie it must be really weird what I'm trying to describe and it becomes like this weird like ever moving melting um, visualization like when he's talking to the sod or dark side you know this is the way they communicate instead of a screen it's like this 3d vision uh, 3d burning molten fiery thing <laughs> like you know it's like hell communication perfect and um, to have that as your first, somewhat your first scene with Darkseid, right? Um, I mean, we saw him in the flashback, but to actually see him interacting with Steppenwolf, this is the first time he's talking and all this. And he looks scary. Like, you know, he's melting in this black uh, uh, molten metal 
that's like fiery. It's almost like this lava magma display that Steppenwolf is talking to. And I think I like the idea that it, it, it just so happens he plugged it into this metal thing. So that's what the display image would look like. But what if he plugged it into somewhere else, right? Like, well, what does this technology do? Or is it only metal? Whatever. But it was a cool concept that it would just take whatever existed and use that as display. Anyway, so all that nerding out. Uh, I like the look of it, and it seemed to fit with the way I draw nowadays, which is a lot of shadows and darks and silhouettes and all that kind of stuff. So um, I kind of was experimenting on how to translate the way I feather with traditional inks into digital inks so this was kind of like an experiment i've been doing it with all the other drawings but this one i feel like i pushed it um a little harder um and um this time lapse is actually a lot longer than <laughs> than this i had to edit it down because it was just too much um you can see here i'm trying to put one of his quotes into his body just like i did with steppenwolf i kind of like the idea of that maybe it looks weird uh, I'm, it's just this kick that I'm on. I kind of like putting quotes from the movie into the drawing. The ones that stick into my head. And that was it. But I think after a while, it just wasn't happening. Um, I don't know what made me decide to get rid of it. Sometimes I like it. Sometimes I don't. Sometimes I'll stick with it. Like with Steppenwolf. Instead of trying to make it look like a t-shirt. <laughs> with the um, quote on his chest. I kind of try to work it into the drawing, but whatever the reason was, I did not go with that in this one. I think I kind of like trying to figure out the design for his armor. Um, the concept artist who does this, uh, the designs for Steppenwolf and Darkseid, has it up on his Instagram. Um, um, I think I'm blanking out on his name, but has it up on his Instagram, and he has better detailed uh, drawings of what this armor looks like for him and Steppenwolf. And it's insane. I don't even know how you could think like that. <laughs> it like It's just so structurally complicated, but it works. In any case, it was fun to try to figure it out. And then when I couldn't figure it out, I just fudge it. Like literally, it looked like molten fudge. So no problem. <laughs> um. I liked doing I like doing this kind of dripping texture uh, because it kind of leans into this feathering, like I said. But I kind of figured it out in one of my Inktober drawings for this robot that was coming out of the water, and I love trying to show things um, dripping with water, like wet or rain. Um, and I've always liked it when. John Romita Jr. drew it. It was all over like his comics. Uh, believe when he was drawing Daredevil, there were like these typhoid Mary uh, issues, and I don't know. I, I just always think he's always in the rain, and it looks so great. Like you know, with all the um, water striking like Daredevil's costume, and it's bouncing off and stuff like that. And I just, it's just hard for me. I figure like in my head, it's hard for me to try to draw something wet. And John Romita Jr., I felt like, did it really cool. That captured my attention, for sure, because I just sit there looking at it. Um, the other guy that I like doing that is Will Eisner. And he did things where it would be like water dripping down into another panel and all that kind of stuff. I, I, it's just great stuff. Um, oh, the concept artist's name is Gerard Morantz. Uh, he's he's got awesome stuff. You should take a look at his stuff on Instagram. It, he's done work for all sorts of stuff, not just Justice League. Uh, I think he designed like some of the Infinity War bad, bad guys. I think maybe he even designed some of Thanos's uh, armor. I'm not sure if it's the final design. Someone can correct me. Um, but his work is just great. It's uh it's like this really scary looking stuff. Um. And it's a perfect fit. Uh, his Dasad looks so awesome. Awesomely creepy. 
and I liked how the CG artists were able to bring emotion to those like very scary demonic faces faces that they had like even Steppenwolf had like the most expressive eyes and it was a choice because they needed to show that in the movie um, and the sod also has a moment where he kind of has this uh, uh, as he's talking to Darkseid towards the end he has a moment where he it looks like he has a little bit of fear or almost like he's he asks Darkseid like like you know basically it's almost like are you going to give up searching for the anti-life right like you know we can't do anything like that and when Darkseid says like no I got I'm going to go get it because it's this is what I've been looking for all this time he kind of has the sod has this expression on his face where he's almost um disappointed that Darkseid decides to to look for the anti-life equation or at least maybe I'm reading into it but his face definitely changes expression and it looks great um, anyway so now I'm coloring um, Darkseid this drawing I, I really liked it in black and white so sometimes I have this kind of hurdle I have to jump over because sometimes I'm so stuck and thinking okay black and white's fine I'm done but and for these drawings, I wanted to add color. So now the other problem is how do I add color to this without losing some of this, the contrast and the detail that I liked having in the black and white. So the idea here, still the uh, simple colors, is uh, my color theory is just blue and orange, right? Nothing too crazy. And I wanted things to glow. So that was the thing that kind of pulled me to doing this in color because I like this glow effect that I've been stumbling on. Um, for the most part, I don't think I've been doing the lighting, the light pen in this drawing. I was more, I think I have some of it, but I'm really coloring in the ink lines. So around his eyes, I think, instead of a stark black, I start putting in this gray color. And then um i'm applying like these highlights where it's like orange highlights bouncing off of like his he has this upside down omega on his chest that i kind of like um and it's lit uh usually in at least I, I believe it's lit when he was or at least that part of his body was lit when he was talking to steppenwolf in this like molten magma communique <laughs> And that was like the perfect place to put like this bounce light coming off. And like his eyeballs the same way, like, you know, it lit up his nose and so on. But I remember I, I still had to kind of, even though my technique is usually simple, where it's just highlight, no, um, highlight, color, and then shadow, right? Three colors. I still wanted to push back certain things. So I think his armor stands out with a different blue than like his neck um, I don't know if you can tell but you know it's a little darker even the highlights in there are a little darker just a little bit so that then his helmet like say or like the area around his eyeballs are brighter um, that's where I want to put the attention to and his chest right and I love the trick of just like drawing the highlights in um, not sure if I mentioned it, but I, I learned this at RISD where I went to college when I was doing this master study of like this Marat painting. I oh, the, the death of Marat. Sorry, I've forgotten the artist. I'm a moron. But the death of Marat. And it's the uh, it's a horrible painting that I did. Not not the painting itself. The painting is amazing. I learned a lot. And one of the things that came out was I didn't have to draw the whole thing. Like, I think it was a knife on the ground in the shadows. And once I put in the highlight of the edge of the knife, my brain just kind of filled in the rest of that knife. Um, and so that's kind of something I'm taking with here, just with the highlights. Um, and this is the final uh, colored version right here. And I'll take you a few steps back. So here's, here's the sketch. Um, I kind of try to get most of it there. But not the detail, because that's just that's the fun part. That's when I ink it later. And then as I ink it, I'm gonna try to push back certain things I don't want to be seen, like or to bring more light 
to places like his eyeballs. And here's a close-up of uh, the detail of his face on his face. So you can see how I'm like coloring in the, the ink work, right? I'm coloring through. And here's a shot of his chest area. Um, you can kind of see it closer here, how I colored it in. And that's it for um, this episode. This is the final drawing. Hope you guys enjoyed my step-by-step -step and ranting. I'll see you guys next episode.